thank you for coming. This is a talk about Michael Hollingshead, and I'm going to compress 52 years of his life into 30 minutes. I'm from Yorkshire. I talk fast in an accent, so please do keep up. There are books for sale afterwards. These are the special hardback uh, deluxe editions, which are collector's items. And for anyone who buys one, there's a ultra rare free Divine Rascal badge. And for anyone who comes to me and says, I'm an acid head, you can have an acid head badge free. <laughs> On that basis, let's go. Um, you've probably all heard about Michael Hollingshead. I used to read about him for years in various things. You know, he was the guy who turned Leary on, and then he sort of dropped off the radar. Um, but when I was researching for Albion Dreaming, my, my, talk about the, my book about the history of LSD in Britain, his name kept cropping up again and again. And I thought, there's something about this guy. He was everywhere. He was like a psychedelic z -league. One minute he was in uh, Darlington, where he was born. Next minute he was in New York. Then he'd be in Nepal, uh, California, Tonga, um, uh, Scotland, all over the place. And he was always up to something. And of course, if you've read the Leary uh, biographies and histories, um, you'll know that he was the person who turned Tim Leary onto LSD, which is interesting. But we'll get to that in a bit. But first, who was Michael Hollingshead? Well, for a start, he wasn't Michael Hollingshead. His actual name is Michael John Shinkfield. Michael Hollingshead was the name he affected when he moved to America, and we'll come to that later. Now, if this works... Ooh, there we go. That's him. And many rare photographs in the book that no one's ever seen before. This is one of them. Probably the best of the photographs about it, uh, of him there. And that's his, the title of his autobiography, which I'll mention um, shortly. But who was he? Well... Was he a fool? Ugh, a fool? Was he an acid guru? Was he a trickster? Was he a black magician? Some people said he was. Was he psychologically and emotionally disturbed? Certainly. Was he a junkie and an alcoholic? Absolutely. Uh, what have we got there? What else have we got? <laughs> Charlatan. Oh my God, yes. <laughs> uh, where are they? Secret agent? Mm, possibly, we're not sure. Uh, genius? Yes, absolutely. Um, deeply spiritual? He thought he was. And Catalyst for Social Change, he certainly was part of that. Yeah, there's no doubt about that. And I think there might be one more. The man without whom Leary would not have happened, Leary wouldn't have happened in the same way without Hollingshead. Leary would have happened one way or the other, but not the same. And um, the man who turned on the world. Well, yes, I suppose he did, indirectly. Selfish sociopath. Oh, yes, very much so. Charismatic, absolutely. Criminal, God, yes. I think... Oh, there's another one. Police informer. Absolutely. Um, so there's a lot of um, what's going on there about him. So where did he come from? Well, for a guy who turned Tim Leary on, who then turned the world, world on, it's a bit weird, isn't it, that Michael Hollingshead, we'll call him Hollingshead even though he's Shinkfield, was born in 1931 in Darlington in the north of the east of England, which at that time was a grubby little mining town famous for railways and coal. Um, his father was a colliery... Um, Clark, if you like, and he had uh, a nice traditional upbringing at first, but as he grew up a little bit, he suddenly worked out that, as was the style of many men in uh, those days, his father was a serious alcoholic and a wife beater. And um, Michael didn't particularly like that. So as he grew up, he sort of began to notice his father and, and his mother having lots of uh, problems all the time. And what he did, he came home from school one day found his, his father beating his, his mother up. This was when he was about, I think, 10 or 11 or something like that. And of course, because he was growing up to be a man and he didn't want to see his mother hurt, he jumped in and tried to stop it happening. And of course, as is the way, unfortunately, in many abusive relationships, the mother sided with the father. Hollingshead was flung out of the way and he was left... He didn't know what had happened. He said his quote to his daughter Vanessa later in life was, at that moment, I threw away the key, meaning I, I wanted nothing more to do with my parents. A couple of years later, when he was 14, he did something. Now, nobody knows what this thing was, but it was bad enough for him to be sent away 300 miles to Red Hill School, um, uh, not far from London. Now, at that time, in, in the um, uh, mid-40s it was at that time, this was a school where people who had serious psychological and emotional problems were sent to. Uh, they had 40 places a year available out of the many thousands that were referred to them. So whatever Hollingshead did was bad enough to get him sent to Red Hill. It was run by a colleague of um, uh, Freud's daughter, and it was run on psychoanalytical principles. Uh, it was the sort of place where you, you called the teacher by the first name. There were no rules. It was all done by uh, daily meeting and everything. 
and he was supposed to be cured of whatever he was. Now, the files for Red Hill School um, uh, exist, but uh, I'm not allowed access to Hollingshead's files until, I don't know, like 100 years from whenever they were put away, uh, which is rather sad. Um, and you can see, if I've got my pointing device, the picture there. How does that work? That's Hollingshead there. Uh, second trolley from the left there, in his, in his blazer with his hand around a, a youth in front of him, which is quite sort of interesting. Um, <laughs> <laughs> he did very well at that school. He, he developed a tal talent for mimicry. Um, it was up to all sorts of shenanigans. He got published extensively in the school uh, newsletter, and the, the school used to have a, um, an annual art exhibition in uh, the Cooling Gallery in London every year, and he had uh, artworks depicted there, long since lost, but the two he had uh, depicted one year was, uh, were called Sorrow and Dream, and that's the title of my first chapter, because his whole life is a mixture of sorrow and dream. After he left um, Red Hill School, like all young men in those days, he had to do two years national service. And this is a picture of him at um, RAF West Kirby on the Wirral, which is the place where people went before they were dispatched off to whatever speciality they were going to train in. Now, again, national service records, can't, can't track them down. I've certainly tried, but, um, but they don't appear to exist. So I've no idea what he actually did in national service. But the chances are he learnt Swedish and Norwegian, because in the early 50s, after a short spell in London, he, um, he suddenly appeared in um, Sweden and he married a Swedish woman and they had a son. And at that time he was working for the University of Copenhagen and he was writing and broadcasting for Swedish media, doing a lot of programmes on Swedish radio about life in London, sort of for a, a Brit's view of tourism for, for Swedish people. He had lots going on, heavy drinker. It was also to in, to in and fro in between um, Copenhagen and London. And at, at some point during this uh, time, he met some very key people who were to be sort of influential for the rest of his life. Um, four people there. I'm sure you all know exactly who they all are, but it's not a quiz. Um, guy there, Dr. John Beresford, who we met uh, in London in the early 50s. That's a guy called Desmond O'Brien, who's an ex Etonian socialite and millionaire. Uh, Alex Trocchi, the famous poet and heroine fancier. And Brian Barrett, who sort of spanned all scenes from the beats right through to the hippies. And he met all those at varying times in the, um, in the late 50s. Now, many adventures involving uh, heroin, to which he became addicted at that time. Um, uh, a lot of dope smoking, a lot of alcoholism. Uh, one of his specialities was him and Trocky would go to the posh London clubs and chat up the Debs, uh, fuck them, and then screw them for all the money that he could get out of them. So, not a particularly nice man. 1959, his marriage to uh, Ebba, his Swedish wife, had fallen apart. And he thought, I know, I'll go to America, because it was just like the very, very, very start of the British invasion. And he could, he could sense that Britons were going to be able to do well I in New York. So he sailed on to like September 5th, 1959, um, to, um, to New York, where he moved into a flat. He hooked up again with his old colleague, John Beresford, who was by now by that time a paediatrician at a big New York hospital. Um, he found another young lady, uh, uh, Sophie Nyman, there, and you can see that they were all lovey-dovey right from the start. If you look at the body language, they don't like each other, do they? And that's maybe six months after they're married, so we're talking about er early to mid-1960, and that's one of them reclining in a, um, in a deck chair. He was still looking very straight at that time. In fact, he always did. Um, anyway, when he, when he sort of contacted Dr. John Beresford again, he found out that John had taken an interest in drugs, you see. And there was a, a store on, uh, in Greenwich Village, can't remember its name, where you could go buy, um, uh, you know, San Pedro, peyote. Uh, you could buy all manner of chemicals and herbs and everything. So, of a weekend, Hollingshead and... Um, and Dr. John Beresford were getting wasted and having parties at an office that Beresford rented, unbeknownst to his wife. Uh, young ladies were involved, you know, the usual sort of thing when, when, when drugs happen. Um, and at, at one point, they started reading about LSD, which was just sort of being talked about. And um, Michael said to John Beresford, I think we really should be trying this sort of drug. How can we get some? So Hollingshead phoned, allegedly phoned, Aldous Huxley up. This is what he writes in his autobiography, I have never found any record of 
Huxley saying he ever spoke to Hollingshead, so we don't know that's true. And with everything in Hollingshead's life, you've got to take it with a pinch of salt because he was a liar to serve his own ends. He may have spoken to Huxley, it's possible, but I'm not certain. Huxley said, uh, well, you know, you need to get hold of some, some LSD, and when you've done so, uh, the man you need to speak to is a guy called Tim Leary. So, now we get to the sort of er story of psychedelic history, which you'll read about, which always says that Tim Leary got the um, LSD because Michael Hollingshead brought it to him. And Hollingshead in his book says, I ordered the LSD from Sandoz, they delivered a gram to me, and I took it to Leary. Well, yes and no. What actually happened, I think, based on interviews and the information I've got from the Beresford family, is that, yes, um, Hollingshead persuaded Beresford to write to Sandoz to buy a gram, which is fairly easy in those days, and it came labelled Lot H00247 or something. Now, Hollingshead says he took that acid with Beresford, had an amazingly bonkers psychedelic experience, which he, he relates in his autobiography, and thought, what the fuck are we going to do with this? So they eventually dosed it all down, according to Hollingshead, into something like 5,200 gram doses, at uh, 200 microgram doses, and it was all in a, the legendary mayonnaise jar, which you read about, about Hollingshead trotting around to Leary with his mayonnaise jar. Now there's a problem there for a start, because so I, I thought there was something odd about that for years, and then when I was writing the book, I thought, I know, I'll get your standard American mayonnaise jar, I'll get some icing sugar, I'll get, put a gram of milk powder in, mix it all up, and I'll spoon it into a jar and see if you get 5,000 doses in there. Do you fuck? You're lucky to get four or 500 doses in there. So the whole foundation story is a lie. What happened to the rest of those doses? What form did Hollingshead have them in? And did he indeed have the whole gram? No, he didn't. Beresford retained half of the original magic gram, which, and I'll come into proof of that later. So anyway, then uh, Hollingshead thought, right, I'm going to get in touch with Leary. And the stories in Leary's accounts and in Hollingshead's own account, own account are quite so straightforward. He went to, to where uh, Leary was staying, badgered him for a bit, and then uh, Leary took him in. But it was more than that. Hollingshead actually said, threatened by letter to Leary, after the first meeting where Leary was very dismissive of him, that he was going to commit suicide if Leary didn't take him seriously. Now, Leary was a nice bloke, and he said to, I think it was Ralph Metzner who, who was with him at the time, I can't let this, this poor Englishman who was going through all these traumas and troubles commit suicide. He must come and live with us. So within the space of a couple of weeks of the meeting, Hollingshead was installed in the Leary household, um, turning people on right, left, and centre. Um, but of course, Leary didn't want to take acid. He was heavily into his psilocybin research at that time. And for him, psilocybin was the be all and end all of psychedelic experiences. Um, and um, Hollingshead was trying to persuade him and say, no, you've got to take this. And Leary said, no, you, you, know, you take some psilocybin, you know, it'll blow your mind. Hollingshead took about four times the dose of what Leary was taking and said, well, yeah, it's nice, but you really need to try some acid. <laughs> Leary wasn't having it. The classic story then is um, one night, uh, uh, Maynard Ferguson, jazz trumpeter, who was a friend of uh, Leary's, was staying there at the weekend after a gig, and um, Maynard and Fleur were both sort of potheads, and you know they like to get high. And uh, Hollingshead said, "Do you fancy a spoonful of, uh, of acid?" So they said, "Well, yeah, sure." So he trotted upstairs, came back with his jar, gave them a spoonful. They all had a spoonful. Leary's doing some exam notes or something, and they sat back. And about I don't know half an hour, forty-five minutes in it. Flo, Flo Ferguson sits up and said, wow, you've just got to try this, Tim. This is, this is amazing. So Leary thought, I've got to. So again, dosed up by Hollingshead, and that, you read all the accounts of his first experience, blew Leary's mind, smeared it across the multiverse. And for weeks afterwards, he, was a, he adopted Hollingshead as a guru. And Metzner and um, Richard Alpert uh, were very, very worried about the influence that, that Hollingshead um, actually had on him. Uh, Hollingshead then was, uh, was paid by Leary as a housekeeper and also to help him with the research and um, he was involved in the Marsh Chapel uh, psilocybin experiments and so on and so forth. Um, and I'm glossing over everything so much I'll be lucky if I get to the end of it at, at this speed because the book is just packed with stuff you've never even heard of. Um, anyway, when, when Millbrook, sort of, uh, not Millbrook, when um, the Harvard fell apart because they were, they were kicked out for dosing students up, um, Hollingshead thought, right, I know, I'll, I'll go to Jamaica, a bit of a holiday. Flew to Jamaica, but he used Leary's name uh, to falsify a cheque. 
And that was the start of the many, many rip-offs that, that Hollingshead did with Leary and many other people. Uh, so Leary and him fell out at that point, and Leary and Hollingshead have a love-hate relationship all through Hollingshead's life. They, they sort of needed each other in a way, but at the same time, Leary was a bit uncertain about Tim and... Uh, sorry, not Leary. Was, Leary was uncertain about Hollingshead, and Hollingshead desperately wanted to be a Tim Leary. He saw himself as a guru, uh, and this thread runs throughout his entire life. Um, in 1962-63, uh, Hollingshead was hanging around with John Beresford again, who very kindly let him back into his life after ripping the acid off. And um, Beresford started the Agora Trust in New York, which Hollingshead completely ruined, as you'll read in the book, uh, to the point where he had the um, phone tapped and the police were listening in on to conversations, which Beresford knew about, but because he was a very... Pacific, uh, yeah, Pacific Buddhist type of guy was just laid back about it and didn't object. Um, so, and that was completely trashed. But one interesting thing that I did dig up was this, which is John Beresford's 1963, you can just see the 63 at the top, calendar book. Um, and in it, on Monday the 14th of, of whatever month it was, he writes there, he's given somebody 50 somethings of H0047, 0047, that is the number of the magic gram. And that, to me, proves what Beresford's family have told me, that Beresford did retain a considerable portion of the original magic gram, thus giving the lie to, to Hollingshead's um, story about it. I mean, this is drug geek stuff, isn't it, really? But to me, it's absolutely fascinating, <laughs> tinkering with the, mach the machinery of what went on and how and who said what about it. Um, the next big phase in his life was, um, was Millbrook. Um, when Hollingshead heard that Leary had got set up at Millbrook and they were having a wild old time there, he had to be there. So um, August, 64, six, yeah, August 64, he moved into Millbrook. And he um, basically, he, he, he just hung out there. And he was the person that a lot of people uh, ended up tripping with if Leary wasn't there. And he would do bonkers things like... Um, you know, where they're all in the middle of a massively heavy trip and they're all on a different planet somewhere, he'd appear at the window in a kilt bouncing up and down on a trampoline with a violent, a violent light behind him. Or, or he'd tell a, a group of people that he could show them the secret of the universe, but only if they got really high and followed his instructions. And they would. And then, so sort of like 2 o'clock in the morning, he leads them into the subterranean passages underground, so they had to crawl through the dark, and it was lit by a candle, and they were all going, wow, what's going to happen? And they get to the end of a, of a, um, of a dead-end corridor, and Hollingshead reveals a mirror, which they either got it or they didn't. <laughs> Um, and this sort of thing went on when, when Leary went on his honeymoon to, to India with, with uh, Nena, his, his bride, the model. Um, Hollingshead and um, met, uh, sorry, Hollingshead and, and Alpert and a few other people holed up in the bowling alley there and basically just was taking acid day after day after day, night. After, they just weren't coming down. They were seeing how high they could get, for how long, and, and what would happen. Um, and that just fucked Millbrook up, basically. Everything that was happening there that was good went to pot. And what happened... Um, oh, yeah. I don't think I've got a picture of that. Um, what happened then was in, in uh, August 65, Hollingshead had started to think about um, coming back to London because he'd heard that... He'd been told that the tripping scene in, in London and Britain was very, very primitive and people weren't doing it the Leary way, which is obviously the, the proper way to do it. So Leary thought, well, that's a good idea. What I'll do is I'll come to Europe speak at the Royal Albert Hall and all over Europe, and I'll be as big in Europe as I am in America. So he encouraged Hollingshead to go, and he gave him what he called Operation London, gave him a load of acid, and told him to go to London, set up the World Psychedelic Centre, and uh, Leary would pop over at Easter, and there'd be a big rally, and um, uh, him and uh, Alpert would come over, and they dubbed the Royal Albert Hall the Royal Alpert Hall, because that's where they were going to speak. So, Hollingshead... Oh, that's, a, that's a pure blue-white, apparently. Um, yes, that, that's one of his quotes he, he wrote in, in 1965. The psychedelic movement in England was small and badly informed. Now, I've talked to many of the people involved in the psychedelic movement in, in England at that time, and it might have been small, but it wasn't badly informed. Um, and he, was, he said the spiritual content of the psychedelic experience was being overlooked. Well, if it was, so what? Because you don't have to have a spiritual content to a psychedelic experience. It, it, you know, it's a, it's a non-specific sensory amplifier. But, you know, Leary was gung-ho for that sort of thing. Um, and... Um, it also meant that he could go over there, take the Tibetan Book of the Dead, you know, the LSD tripping version of that, and they would have a guided uh, manual for LSD sessions, so those Londoners could do it right. Um, so anyway, he came over to London, and Desmond O'Brien, who's the um, millionaire I talked about earlier, funded and financed the World Psychedelic Centre in Pont Street, 
um, in, in London. A uh, very lavish flat. It was all decked out with, with um, tripping visuals, lovely carpets, uh, blah, blah, blah. And uh, uh, Hollingshead set about trying to take over London and, and imprint the leery way of tripping on, um, on him. Um, oh, that's right. But before he went, they had a meeting about it, and Leary said... When Dick Alpert and I stood on the dock in New York waving goodbye, I said to Dick, well, that writes off the psychedelic revolution in England for at least 10 years. So it was partly to get rid of Hollingshead as well as to also get Leary a foothold in London. Um, but when Hollingshead got to London, he was, quote, very impressed by the happy scene he found there. Lots of young people and acid, eating sugar with no one putting over a big mystery scene. That quote's from Joe Mellon, who wrote, wrote Borehole. Uh, Joe, big acid head in the mid-60s in, in London. And, you know, they were just having fun. But they were using sugar to avoid uh, having bad trips, basically. And this was a, was a theory developed by... Um, um, Bart Hugers um, from, from the continent, who said that basically you need sugar in your system when you're tripping, otherwise you're going to crash. Whereas the leery and the sort of spiritual approach was, oh, you need to fast on blah, blah, blah for X number of days beforehand and your body needs to be pure. Well, maybe it does, but all that's going to happen is you're going to spend the whole trip doing like that because you've got nothing in your system. So buy Mars bars. Um, <laughs> and the way that, um, that Joey described uh, Hollingshead's way of tripping was always in a darkened room smelling of incense with a commentary by the guru. That was the way the Americans had devised to keep put people on, on sugar lacks in control. But it didn't really work. Uh, there's a lot in the book about how Hollingshead ran his uh, sessions in, um, in London. Oh, yeah, and that's another quote. That was from uh, Jeff Dexter, who found him and his cronies found Leary hard going, too falsified in some ways, whereas reading Huxley, there was a certain clarity to it. And the, the, the British trippers were, were far more... Um, I don't know, far more fun, I think. This uh, may have actually been Hollingshead's flat. I was told it was, I'm not too sure, but basically this was a 1966 flat in London, equipped with a light show and lots of stunned people going like that. Um, <laughs> that's what they did. Um, anyway, this, this all went on, and, and it, originally it was sending um, proclamations out about you know, acid philosophy and how you should do it, and encouraging people to do this, that, and the other. But at the same time, it was developing a massive methadrine habit, because it was um, tripping every night, and it was tripping using acid and methadrine to give the, um, to give the acid some um, motive power, rather than just getting lost in the moment. And then, because it was up all night, in the day, it was having to take heroin to go to sleep to get some rest. So it was spiralling out of control. Um, uh, the World Psychedelic Centre became a party house. It got raided. A, uh, Hollingshead got bussed somewhere in London, not at the house, in January for uh, some hash. And then on the night of, I think it was the 4th of March that year, the police raided and they found um, morphine, uh, cannabis. They didn't find any acid because they didn't know what to look for because it was in liquid and they had no idea. Five people got bussed. Um, Hollingshead went to court uh, on the day after and it was bailed to May. He did a runner. He just thought, I'm not, I can't cope with this. I'm going to get sent down. Um, and as soon as he'd done a runner, uh, he, he saw an advert on, on, uh, in another magazine for London Life who were running an expose of the World Psychedelic Centre, the drug that could threaten London. Um, and that's it there. And it was, it was, it was talking about um, um, the fact that, you know, it's unscrupulous people could dose up London's water supply and everyone would be high. The myth of LSD in the water is just a myth. You can't do it. But in those days, people believed that sort of nonsense. What they didn't know was um, the um, World Supply Psychedelic Centre had been infiltrated by um, uh, police officers who had accidentally dosed themselves on the psychedelic punch and lots of reporters. And basically, this just blew it wide open. And of course, it didn't help that Desmond O'Brien, who was quoted extensively in there, referred to himself as Mr. LSD, which is like saying, oh, I'm Mr. Big. You know, it, it just makes you sound stupid. So the whole thing fell apart. Um, Hollingshead on the run. Um, one minute, Andy. One minute? I've got three hours to go, yeah. Um, well... <laughs> <laughs> if you can only have a minute, you're going to miss an awful lot. If you want to stay here in the break, can I continue through the break? Well, we're going to have All right. Uh, so oh, I've got a minute, um, and I'm about a quarter of the way through the story. But it's very good. Uh, there's much, much more than, I, than I've said, and the, the way to find out more is to buy the book. Thank you very much.